All right, so my talk is called The Interaction of Philosophy and Theology in Aquinas' Christology. It's pretty standard to speak of Aquinas as a thinker whose greatness partly consisted in seeing how philosophy and theology can work together. In this context, a phrase one often hears is the harmony of faith and reason. Speaking about Aquinas like this isn't wrong. At a time when a good number of theologians were suspicious of non-Christian philosophers, Aquinas studied Aristotle and others carefully and made extensive use of their ideas. Aquinas' idea was that since reason and faith are both divine gifts, there's no reason to fear that they will turn out to be incompatible. Now, one way for two things to be compatible is for them to have nothing to do with one another. I suppose it's obvious enough that this isn't what Aquinas has in mind. Philosophy and theology for Aquinas really do interact. But that doesn't mean that things will always go smoothly. Aquinas' view is that faith and reason are compatible in principle. In practice, what's going on in our heads isn't always what faith really says and what reason really says, but instead, what we think faith says and what we think reason says, and between those, all sorts of contradictions can arise. In practice, then, it's sometimes necessary to make rather serious adjustments in our thinking before we arrive at that happy place where faith and reason are in harmony. My goal in this paper is to illustrate some ways in which this interaction and adjustment plays out, focusing on examples drawn from Aquinas' Christology. I will mostly be discussing how Aquinas actually proceeds in his Christology, rather than discussing explicit methodological remarks that he makes. The reason for this isn't that there's a lot of tension between his explicit methodology and his actual procedure, but rather that he doesn't make very many methodological remarks. Mostly, he just sticks to first-order business. Before indicating my plan of attack, let me remind you of some things that Aquinas says early in the Summa Theologiae when he's justifying the idea that we need theology at all. Some truths, he says, are known by reason, while others are available to us through the revelation that we accept by faith. An example of the first would be that tin is an element. An example of the second would be that God is tripersonal. So this gives us two circles, one containing things known by reason and the other containing things known by faith. The two circles overlap. There are things that can be known by reason, but that are also revealed. The goodness and providence of God would be examples of things that fall into this area of overlap. We need to know them for salvation, but the human mind is weak, and most of us don't have enough time to use what little minds we have. So God reveals to us what we need to know, lest our eternal salvation be endangered through busyness or stupidity. So really, there are three zones. The things knowable by reason, but not by faith, because God doesn't reveal them. The things knowable by faith alone, things which God reveals. And the things knowable by reason, but also by faith, because God reveals them too. Now, tricky questions can arise in this connection, and some of them will come up below. But I think this three-way distinction is clear enough for now, and I wish to use it to organize my remarks. In the first main part of the paper, I will discuss a Christological case in which philosophy and theology interact with philosophy playing a sort of leadership role. In the second main part of the paper, I will discuss a Christological case in which philosophy and theology interact but in which the leadership role is played by theology. And then I'll conclude with some more general reflections. Okay, so first section, 
The picture of God presented to us in sacred scripture is not entirely clear, at least at first glance. For example, John 4.24 says that God is spirit, from which it seems pretty reasonable to infer that God is not bodily. But, on the other hand, various scriptural passages make reference to God's holy arm, his footstool, and so on. Traditional Christians are happy to say that God is, in fact, an immaterial spirit and that descriptions of God in corporeal terms are metaphorical. That the Bible might sometimes describe an incorporeal God using corporeal metaphors is not a far-fetched thought, and I have no desire to cast doubt on it. But it does make sense to ask why we resolve the Bible's internal tension in the way that we do. Why don't we say that God is bodily and explain the remark about God's being spirit as perhaps a metaphorical way of indicating that God is rational? It's tempting to answer philosophical reason. In other words, maybe the reason we know that God is spirit is literal and thou didst scatter thy enemies with thy mighty arm is metaphorical, is that we have done enough philosophy to know that God doesn't have an arm. So here, for example, are some philosophical arguments that Aquinas makes in um, Summa Theologiae, Part 1, Question 3, Article 1. Nothing corporeal can be an unmoved mover, but God is an unmoved mover, Therefore, God is incorporeal, or anything corporeal involves potentiality, but God is the first being, and the first being must be entirely actual and in no way potential, so therefore God is incorporeal, or God is the noblest being, and no corporeal being is the noblest being, so therefore God is incorporeal. In the face of philosophical considerations like these, one might say, it simply makes more sense to interpret the bodily descriptions of God as metaphorical than it does to interpret the claim that God is spirit as metaphorical. And so you might say, that's how we know which way to resolve the apparent tensions in scripture. Implicit in this way of thinking are two ideas. First, that revelation presupposes some knowledge already possessed by those who are to receive revelation. Second, that the presupposed knowledge in question includes a fairly sophisticated understanding of the divine nature. Let's take these in turn. It does make sense to think that some knowledge is presupposed by divine revelation. Scripture tells us that God created animals. But does it clearly indicate what animals are in the first place? Scripture that tells us that Joseph was taken to Egypt, but how clear a sense does Scripture give us of where Egypt is located? Scripture addresses itself to our minds, but it doesn't assume that our minds are empty. On the contrary, it takes for granted that we know certain things already. Indeed, this is one of the main points of Augustine's De Doctrina Christiana. But does scripture presuppose that we have a philosophical grasp of the divine nature? That doesn't sound very Thomistic to me. After all, as noted earlier, Aquinas says that revelation is there in part to make up for the fact that a philosophical understanding of God is too hard for most people to arrive at. If Aquinas' idea is that the Bible is there in part, for people who don't have the time or the ability to read Aristotle, then he can't possibly hold that only people who know Aristotle can understand the Bible. Coming at this another way, if Aquinas held that you needed a philosophical understanding of God in order to understand Revelation, that would seem to imply that the virtue of faith merely enables you to accept what God reveals, whatever that turns out to be. But that's not Aquinas' view. He thinks that faith also involves the ability to know what it is that God reveals. 
some, someone with little or no philosophical training will, by divine faith, be able to grasp which biblical assertions are literal and which are metaphorical. If you ask an ordinary believer whether God has an armpit, he's not going to be worried about it. He's going to think you're either a moron or a sophist. <laughs> if Revelation gives us access to the same truths that philosophical theology does, does that mean that philosophical reason plays no role in the life of believers? Does it mean that however helpful philosophy is for pagans, Christians don't use it? No. Aquinas tells us that what's accepted on faith by one person can be known by reason by a different person. In fact, he says that if you know something by reason, you don't hold it by faith. Some people, the ones who know philosophy, know certain truths about God by philosophical reason, including truths that others hold by faith. So, while it's not true that having a philosophical understanding of the divine nature is necessary for a correct understanding of Scripture, it's still the case that some people do arrive at the correct understanding of Scripture on the basis, in part, of a philosophical understanding of the divine nature. The understanding that these people have of Revelation is informed by non-theological philosophical knowledge. Philosophy and theology are interacting, at least in their case. And in that interaction, philosophy is playing something of a leadership role. Now I'd like to give another example, one that is more closely tied to our main topic, Christology. We can know from philosophy that God is impassable and immutable. God cannot receive anything or get modified by anything. God cannot undergo any actualizations of potentialities, and so on. But it's far from obvious how this is consistent with the Incarnation. Don't we say that the Word became flesh? And doesn't that sound like a case of change and actualization? It's tempting to conclude that God does, in fact, change that God does receive actualization from created beings. And furthermore, that this is a noteworthy way in which the gospel overcomes human reasoning. Those Greek philosophers may think that God is pure act, but we Christians know that God grows and changes in a metaphysical dance with creation. Aquinas wants to hold the line here. That's not what God is like. And so Aquinas needs to find a way of understanding the incarnation that preserves divine impassibility and immutability. Aquinas' approach involves repurposing and modifying an idea he had already used to explain the more general relationship between God and creatures. The relationship between God and creatures does vary. Sometimes we are being led through the desert. Sometimes we are being punished. Sometimes we are being fed. But God always stays the same. For Aquinas, this makes sense because being led, being punished, and being fed are all relations. And relations can change with only one of the parties to the relation changing. So here I'm just going to insert a little something um, about medieval theory. <coughs> about medieval theories of relations. This is one of these things that you can get very far in your studies and no one ever explains it to you. Um, okay, so at the top up there, you've got two objects, A and B, and they're related by a relation R. And R is this thing, it's a kind of accident, if you will, and it belongs to both A and B. Now this is the, like the analytic philosophy way of thinking about relations. So the relation is one thing, and it belongs to both of the objects. But that's not the way the medievals thought about relations. The way the medievals think about relations um, is below the squiggly line. So you've got two objects, A and B, and then, so A is related to B by a relation R1, and then B is related to A by a different relation R2. So A has its own relational accident, 
it's the subject of that accident, and the term of that relation is B, and then B has its relational accent. It's the subject of its own numerically distinct relational accent, which has A as a term. So that's the sort of normal, standard case. But the medievals also thought um, that you can have a case where you have only one of them. It's like a halfway case. You can actually have a case where you have neither of them. That's where we speak of things as being in relation, but they really aren't at all. It's just the way we think of it. But that doesn't matter for right now. So uh, I'll explain this. You'll, you'll see in a second what I'm thinking of. But the fact that the R1 and the R2 are distinct, at least it's possible that you could have R1 without having R2. And that's going to turn out to be really important. OK. So let me back up a bit. For Aquinas, being led, being punished, and being fed are all relations. And relations can change with only one of the parties to the relation changing. Just now, you weren't thinking of the Eiffel Tower. But now you are. Therefore, the relationship between you and the Eiffel Tower has changed. But the Eiffel Tower hasn't changed. Only you have. Okay? And so when, when thinking of the Eiffel Tower, is there's a relation from you aiming out at the Eiffel Tower. But there's nothing in the Eiffel Tower aiming back to you. It's just supremely indifferent to, the, to you. We say it is being thought of by you. But all the metaphysical machinery for that is really just in you. All right. So Aquinas applies that sort of situation, the kind of one-way relation that you get when you have a thinker and a thought about object. He applies that, he applies that sort of analysis to the, to the relation between God and the world. When relations between God and creatures change, what's really happening is only that the creatures are changing, and God just stays the same the whole time. So there are no relations in God. He's just what he is. And then the created creatures change their relation. If you really want to upset people and cause a lot of trouble, you can say God is not related to the world. And then everybody gets upset, and like, there's no reason to be this aggressive, OK? <laughs> God and the world are like related to one another. But it just turns out that because God is simple and unchanging, you need all the metaphysical machinery to be on one side. But there's no reason to be aggressive. OK. Aquinas applies this basic idea also to the incarnation but with a twist. To start with the basic idea, he holds that being united to the word of God, to the second person of the Trinity, is a modification or enhancement of the assumed human nature. That's its, the subject of that relation. And that this is sufficient for the hypostatic union. We don't also need for the word itself to be modified or enhanced by a complementary union connecting it back to the humanity it assumes. Something happens to the human nature, so to speak, without anything happening to the word. Okay, So if you wanted to illustrate the case of God and creation or the case of um, the incarnation, you would just erase the R2 there. But now we need to add the twist. In the case of the incarnation, and only in the case of the Incarnation, the created reality isn't merely joined to God. It's joined to God in person, Aquinas said. That's to say, in a way that results in there being only one person. The assumed human nature does not give rise to a newly existing human person, a person that gets joined to the person of the word in friendship or cooperation or whatever. Instead, the assumed human nature makes one and the same already existing divine person to be human as well. I want to sum this up now with an eye on bringing out what's important for our theme of the interaction between philosophy and theology. Aquinas does not allow the idea that the word became flesh to talk him out of his belief in the impassibility and immutability of God. Instead, he allows this philosophically grounded teaching about God 
to be a constraint on his theological account of the Incarnation. Under the force of this constraint, he has to redeploy his understanding of creation in a new way. Philosophy is serving as a constraint on theology, and yet the result is theology is coming up with a new and interesting way of thinking about what's possible. In particular, that you can have one of these one-way relations that's also a relation in person. So while philosophy here leads theology, it does so in a way that results in an, in an enhancement of what theology can do, rather than a diminishment. So it's kind of like one of those good managers that like helps you do better. <laughs> All right. Or should I say dissertation director? <laughs> Too close to home? <laughs> I hope not. OK. That's the first section. Now here comes the second section. I want now to explore a different kind of case, one in which theology takes the leadership role. Recall the classic formula for the incarnation that was arrived at by the fifth century. Jesus is one person who exists in two natures, divinity and humanity. A person, as classically understood, is a special kind of substance. A substance is an independent, unified individual, and therefore, since a person is a special kind of substance, a person is a special kind of independent, unified individual. What makes a person different from a non-person is this. Persons have reason. A cat and a human are both substances, but humans are persons, while cats are not. To say that persons have reason is to suggest something about their natures. So that leads us to the second element of the classic formula, namely nature. A nature is what something is at its most basic or foundational level. A thing's nature constitutes that thing as an independently subsisting thing of a certain kind. How do these notion, notions of person and nature function in Christology? To say that Christ is one person is to push back against any suspicion that he might actually be a team of persons working closely together. Jesus is not a human person working closely together with a divine person, the Son. Rather, he and the Son just are the very same person. To say that Christ has two natures and that these natures are humanity and divinity is to say that Christ really is human and that he really is divine. He is not merely human in outward appearance, but really and truly human, not merely inspired by God, but literally personally divine. The core points can be put in terms of two principles, the integrity principle and the unity principle. The unity principle states that Christ is really one person. The integrity principle states that each of Christ's natures is there in its fullness and integrity. And now, a difficulty begins to show itself. A substance's nature unlike any of its accidents, constitutes or establishes it at the most basic level. It explains why that substance is an independently subsisting thing of a particular kind. Sounds good, but suppose we apply this way of thinking to the case of the Incarnation. If Christ has two natures, then it seems he has two principles in virtue of which he is an independently existing thing. That would mean that he is really two independently existing things. His divinity, it's starting to sound like, establishes a divine person, while his humanity establishes a human person. Now this pretty clearly violates the unity principle. To protect the unity principle, one might argue that Christ is not entirely human. He has the outward appearance of being human, maybe even a body, 
but ultimately he does not really have a complete human nature. This maneuver would indeed protect the unity principle, but at the cost of abandoning the integrity principle out of the, fr out of the frying pan into the fire. Another more subtle way of doing the same thing is by thinking of Christ's human nature as being an accident rather than a substantial nature. That is not really consistent with holding to the idea that Christ has a true human nature. Faced with all this, someone who was still convinced of the traditional doctrine might be tempted simply to say, well, I don't understand it, but I still believe it, and that's that. I wouldn't want to say that no one should ever believe anything that he can't fully understand. If that were really the rule, then few of us would be entitled to believe that airplanes fly. Accepting the truth of things we can't fully understand can be legitimate. However, in the case at hand, I think that faith can still make progress as it seeks understanding. Let's go back over the problem more slowly. What we said was something like this. The role of a substantial nature is to make something be an independently subsisting thing of a certain kind. But this way of putting it obscures the fact that substantial natures actually play two distinguishable roles. They make something be independently existing, and they make it be of a certain foundational kind. Distinguishing these roles or functions suggests a way of honoring the unity principle without abandoning the integrity principle. First, we can say that both of Christ's natures perform the second function, that is, the function of making something be of some fundamental kind. His divine nature performs the function of making him divine, and his human nature performs the function of making him human. But then we can say that things are different with regard to the first function, namely the function of making something be independently existing. His divine nature does perform that function, but his human nature does not. If his human nature does not perform that function, then Christ will be only one person after all. Okay, so now I have to do something to the whiteboard. That's like saying, turn the hand over, over. It seems that something like the approach that I just sketched out may be what Aquinas had in mind. He says, at Summa Theologiae Tertia Pars, question three, article one, reply to the third objection, the Son of God does not have existence completitaire tear from his human nature, but only existence as human. I've got the Latin up there. I hope you can read that, what's up there. I mean, I don't know why I translated it that way. I'm now looking at it thinking, of why did I translate it that way? But I mean, it's, it's okay. Um, so, Christ's human nature does not just give him existence simply here. It doesn't just unqualifiedly just give him existence in a full-blown, unqualified sense. That's to say, it doesn't give him the independent existence and subsistence characteristic of a substance. It doesn't do that. So if his human nature does not make him be an independently existing person. It does, however, give him existence as human. In other words, it performs the second function, but it doesn't perform the first function. And therefore, it doesn't give rise to a second person and thereby cause a violation of the unity principle. Now, does the fact that Christ's human nature performs only the second function mean that it's not really a human nature after all? That's the problem. It does perform the second function, that of making something human, so it's clearly at least somewhat like a human nature. But is that really enough? To the best of my knowledge, Aquinas does not raise and discuss this question. We're on our own. 
The question again is whether performing just the one function is enough. On one way of thinking, no, it's not enough. Such a way of thinking says that any substantial nature must necessarily establish something as a substance. The fact that Christ's human nature doesn't do this would mean it's not a true substantial human nature. A cat nature isn't a nature unless it actually establishes something as an independently existing feline substance, and a human nature <clears throat> isn't a human nature unless it actually establishes something as an independently existing human substance. If this way of thinking is right, then the Christological problem we've been discussing cannot be solved, because Christ's humanity won't be a real human nature unless it actually does establish something as an independently existing person, which would violate the unity principle. On this way of thinking, preserving the integrity principle makes it impossible to accept the unity principle. But there's another way to think about it. Instead of saying that a substantial nature is something that must establish an independently existing substance, we can say that a substantial nature is something that can establish an independently existing substance. On this way of thinking, something could be a substantial nature even if it didn't actually establish a substance, as long as it, the nature, was the sort of thing that could do so. So, to use a rather distant uh, analogy, something doesn't have to actually explode to be a bomb. It just has to be the sort of thing that could explode. How would this reconfigured way of thinking about substantial natures help with the incarnation? The problem was that seemingly Christ's human nature would not be a real human nature unless it actually established an independently existing person. That's to say, a second person. That would mean that the unity principle was violated. But if we say instead that Christ's human nature need only be capable of establishing an independently existing person, then we could hold that Christ's human nature is a real human nature, even if it doesn't actually establish an independently existing person. It would still be a real human nature because it would still have the intrinsic capacity to establish a person. If Christ's human nature has that capacity, why doesn't it exercise it? The following strikes me as the most promising answer. Because that human nature is joined to the pre-existing person of the Son. Think of it this way. Whatever the Son's human nature does will be something that it does to the Son or for the Son. So if your head lacks all hair, that makes you bald not anyone else. And if my head lacks all hair, that makes me bald, not anyone else. In a roughly parallel way, the son's human nature, if it makes anyone human, will make him human. And if it establishes anyone as an independently existing person, then it will establish him as an independently existing person. Now, prior to having a human nature, the son was not human, so, when the human nature was joined to him, it had an opportunity to exercise the function of making something human. And it did so. But prior to having a human nature, the son was already an independently existing person. So when the human nature was joined to him, it did not get an opportunity to make the son an independently existing person. In and of itself, the human nature had the capacity to make something be a person. But its union with the Son made it unable to exercise that capacity. It arrived too late to make an independent person, but not too late to make an existing person human. Aquinas doesn't say any of this explicitly, 
but I think it is a way of making sense of what he does say. If it's not Thomistic, then perhaps it's Thomistic-ish. <laughs> if I'm right, it preserves in a way consistent with Aquinas' principles, both the unity principle and the integrity principle. That's good. But there still might be a problem. Does taking this approach mean we've basically just given up on philosophical metaphysics in favor of some kind of theological metaphysics? Putting the point in a relatively non-aggressive way, we could say, it's a shame that we didn't start with theology. We could have saved a lot of time. Putting it more aggressively, we could say, it's rather ridiculous to allow one special case based on revelation to substitute for philosophical thinking. In response, I think we can say that in a very important sense, this theological refinement of the philosophical idea of essence or nature doesn't undercut the philosophical idea. The philosophy only understanding of essence or nature says that a person's nature makes that person exist independently. The theological refinement says more cautiously that a person's nature can make that person exist independently. However, as we developed the point above, the only reason why a nature would not exercise that person-making capacity would be that it was united to an already existing substance or person, as happens in the Incarnation. This means that even according to the theology-influenced version of the idea of nature, a person's nature will establish that person as an independently existing person, unless that nature is a second nature, a nature added to an already existing person. In your case, in my case, in Socrates' case, and in everybody's case except Christ's, human nature is not joined to a pre-existing substance or person. In every case but Christ's, a person's human nature is his or her only substantial nature, with the result that it, the substantial nature, most definitely will exercise its person-making capacity. In other words, a substantial nature will refrain from exercising its substance-making capacity only when it belongs to a substance with multiple substantial natures. But the Incarnation is the only case where this happens. Therefore, outside of the Incarnation, what the philosophy only, understand, what the philosophy only understanding of nature says gives us the same result as what the, theolo the theologically influenced version says. In brief, then, in all the cases that philosophy has to deal with, the philosophical account of nature gives us the right answer. What's more, it would be awkward, or worse, pedantic, to constantly be saying, unless, of course, we're dealing with the Incarnation, every time we wanted to talk about natures. So while theological reflection has led us to refine the philosophical account of nature, the re refinement it proposes applies only to the unique theological case that provoked it, leaving the metaphysical cases as they were before and giving us excellent reason to use the philosophical formulation in philosophical contexts. Theology takes the leadership role here, but not in a way that undercuts philosophy. Now I want to consider a different reason for um, doubting that the theological refinement is legitimate. The worry is just that the move is too desperate and too costly. If we, if we have to modify one of the basic concepts of metaphysics to avoid conflict with Christianity, why doesn't that show that actually it's Christianity that's the problem? If my bank account shows that I'm overdrawn, no one is going to allow me to revise the laws of mathematics to prove that really, you know, I'm solvent. There is no way around admitting that it really does make a difference, a huge difference, whether or not 
you actually believe in Christian revelation. If Christian revelation is not true, then this whole, con- this whole discussion has been, at most, an interesting thought experiment, fun to play around with, but not telling us anything about how the world actually is. But if, on the other hand, Christian revelation is true, then the incarnation is a fact. And of course, there's nothing wrong with adjusting our preconceived philosophical notions to fit the facts. The worry was that the theological refinement involves modifying a basic concept of metaphysics, and the response to the worry is to admit that this is what's going on, but to deny that it's worrisome. If divine revelation is real, then bringing our thoughts into line with it could hardly be a mistake. Here are some additional considerations. First, if there really is such a thing as God, then God is going to be very different from us. It shouldn't be surprising, then, to find that our ordinary philosophical ideas, ideas we developed for the purpose of thinking about the created world around us, those ideas are going to turn out to not be adequate for understanding the transcendent creator. This is what we should expect. Second, even though the theological version of the concept of nature is different from the philosophical one, it's hardly devoid of content. Rethinking the notion of nature is nothing like blind faith or just repeating slogans that you don't understand. The fact that the rethinking is based on revelation doesn't prevent it from having plenty of intelligible conceptual content. Third, to repeat a point made earlier, Theological refinements to metaphysics don't mean that the metaphysical concepts we were applying to creation have been wrong the whole time. Theology pretty much leaves philosophy as it is, only adding a special consideration that allows us to handle a unique case. It enables us to see just a little bit more while leaving what we used to be able to see fully visible. I have been saying that we are now able to think about substantial natures in a new way. But who is this we? In particular, do philosophers as philosophers now see things differently? Or is this really something that only theologians do? Under the influence of theology, a philosopher, even a non-believing philosopher, can see this new possibility as possible. He can see the possibility of there being a substantial nature that merely can, but in actuality does not, give rise to an independently existing substance. But a philosopher as such will not affirm that any such nature exists in actuality. Only revelation gives us any right to suppose that this possibility has been realized. The philosopher as such, either the non-believing philosopher or the believing philosopher abstracting from what he holds by faith, will go no farther than acknowledging it as a possibility. But that's not nothing. It is still a way for the philosopher to learn something from theology. To conclude this section, we have been looking at another case of the interaction of philosophy and theology in Aquinas' Christology. The original idea of substantial nature comes from philosophy, of course. When brought into a theological context, it comes to be understood in a, a deeper way and a broader way, a way that can, in its turn, be taken on by the philosopher as part of an intensified understanding of how things can be. Okay, so now just a few concluding remarks. It's almost over. Faith and reason are in harmony in Aquinas' Christology, but as we have seen, it's complicated. Sometimes philosophy points to constraints that the theologian must work within. Sometimes theology uncovers ways in which purely philosophical analysis falls short of grasping the nature 
even of created reality. So who is leading and who is following is not always the same, nor is the notion of leading uncomplicated. When philosophy puts constraints on theology, this need not mean that theology does not get to accomplish its goals, but only that it needs to work harder and more creatively to do so. When theology opens up new horizons for philosophy, this does not mean that philosophy was wrong the whole time, but merely that philosophy was unaware of certain possibilities that it doesn't really, as philosophy, need to think about. Is there an algorithm for knowing when philosophy takes the lead and when theology does? I don't think so. One simply has to push forward in one's inquiries as best one can and see what comes up. But it helps to be aware of the different things that might happen. If this paper has helped you grow in that sort of awareness, then it's achieved its purpose. But Whatever else it has done, it has reached its conclusion. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>